Well, hello again and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Guy Stevens and welcome again to a, another edition of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint uh, Facebook Live training series. We've got a great guest lined up for today. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to say hello to everyone uh, and tell you a little bit about uh, who I am and about the Alliance. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the, the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, we're a group that was formed to raise awareness about the issue of restraint and seclusion in schools across the nation. Uh, our organization advocates for legislative changes to reduce and eliminate practices of uh, restraint and seclusion and to make our schools safer for students, teachers, and staff. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have Dr. Gregory Siskin join us for a live training event, and we're going to introduce Greg here in just a minute uh, and tell you a little bit more about him and what he's going to be talking about. I want to remind you that these events are really intended to support parents, teachers, and other staff during these challenging times. I do want to let you know that we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation today, and we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so feel free to type those in the chat, um, but we will get to those at the end. Uh, also, as a note, uh, today's event will be available to listen to later uh, on Facebook or YouTube. So we record these events and they are available later on Facebook and YouTube. Also, we make the audio version available as an audio podcast. Uh, also, just some exciting news before I introduce the uh, the co-host here. Um, our uh, organization, as the the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint, has been uh, growing. We've been around for a little over a year now, uh, and if you follow us on social media, we've we've got a growing presence on uh, Facebook. Uh, we're actually heading over uh, almost uh, six to eight hundred followers on Facebook, and I want to give a special call out to Jennifer who handles our uh, social media and really does a fantastic job of all the memes and great things that you see. Uh, but we've got a lot of folks that you'll be meeting in the coming weeks for some of our Facebook Live events. Uh, so I wanted to uh, just take a minute and, and call out Jennifer for the fantastic work that she's been doing to help us build our audience. Also, if you are on Instagram, we recently started an Instagram page. Alexa, who is also on our team, uh, is managing the Instagram page. And I would encourage you, if you're on Instagram, to go check it out. So with that, let me introduce to you our co-host. So I'm going to bring onto our stream here, Beth Tolly. Hey, Beth, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. It, it's a pleasure to see you again. I feel like I just saw you a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me introduce Beth. So Beth is uh, co-hosting here today. Uh, Beth is the Director of Educational Strategy for the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, she does amazing research. If you had an opportunity to look at her school to prison pipeline uh, research or about behaviorism, some, some really great in-depth research and has really been making tremendous contributions to, to what we're trying to do here. Uh, Beth retired in 2018 from a leadership position in Virginia's lead agency for early intervention for infants and toddlers. Uh, she's retired, but we're, we're keeping her probably as busy as ever. Uh, Beth is always working on, on many, many projects and a lot of research. Um, and she's got experience as a parent and a grandparent of children that have had behavioral challenges. And this has really fueled a passion for her to improve lives of children and families, you know, through education and mutual support and advocacy. So, uh, Beth, welcome. Um, as always, it's great to have you here today and helping us out. Thank you. It's great to be here. And, and if it, you would be so kind, I'm going to have you. We're going to bring Greg up on screen, and I will uh, ask you if you could to introduce Greg. I will. I will. And I'm going to. I met Greg um, through. We haven't actually met in person, I don't think, <laughs> but right. we have actually done a, a training together, mm -hmm. um, which was great uh, for NAMI. I met Greg. He uh, contacted, I guess, Guy, and uh, he helped us out. He helped me out I, um, with some work I was trying to do with the legislature. So it's really been such a pleasure to know, to know Greg. And so I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to uh, use the information you gave me. Um, I'm probably going to read it because there are a lot of big words on here. <laughs> uh, he's, Greg is the uh, assistant professor of counseling at Eastern Mennonite University. That's EMU. I love that. Um, his specialties include working with trauma throughout the lifespan, particularly in context of attachment patterning in childhood and attachment trauma in adulthood. <clears throat> He has written for the Neuropsychotherapist and Guilford's Play Therapy, a comprehensive guide to theory and practice, and has recently been featured on the Thoughtful Counselor podcast. I got to find that. <clears throat> and I get to practice your name. Dr. Cezanne 
is a board member of the Global Association of Interpersonal Neurobiology Studies, that's GAINS for short, and has trained for several years in the neurosequential model of therapeutics, that's NMT, uh, which is out of um, the Child Trauma Academy and the Neurosequential Network um, that Bruce Perry uh, has developed. He's the designer and coordinator for EMU's integrated EDS, and you can explain what that is, in school counseling. <clears throat> I didn't know this until I got this introduction. Uh, it's a degree program that's launching in the fall of 2021 with an emphasis on trauma, resilience, and restorative practices in schools. And that sounds fabulous. That's really great. And what is an ED? Yes. EDS. Yeah. So it's uh, I sometimes refer to it as sort of a baby doctorate, but um, it's it's a degree in between kind of a master's and a PhD. So oh. um, educational specialist is um, what it's you know if you wrote it out long, that's okay. what it would be. Yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. We're glad you're here. Absolutely, Greg. It's fantastic to have you here today. And Beth, thank you for that great, great intro. Um, you know, we're really excited. And, you know, one of the things that's really exciting to me, you know, when, when we first got to talk, and I know you've been uh, talking and working with Beth as well, is mm -hmm. this momentum building around movement for change. And it's so great to have allies like you and, and so many other amazing people that are all dedicated to to doing better. Because, you know, I think we all know that we can do better mm -hmm. and we're really excited to, to learn more. So I'm going to, again, thank you for, for doing this today. I'm gonna to bring your presentation up onto the screen here. And at this point, Beth and I will, will disappear until you say the magic word, we'll, we'll be summons like a genie. And uh, you will, will come out and help if there's any, any need. Uh, but we're gonna let you take it away. And, and okay. thank you so much, Greg. We, we're really excited to have you today. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for having me. This is um, really a pleasure. And I so appreciate, as I've said uh, to you both, I so appreciate the work um, of the organization and very much um, uh, share the goals of the organization, uh, the Alliance uh, here. So I am thrilled to be able to offer this today. Um, so welcome everybody to attachment security and the neurobiology of crisis trauma and resilience and as beth said um and guy actually gave me the polish pronunciation which was wonderful so i'm uh, dr greg sizan or Chistian, uh if you're if you want the polish uh, i'm assistant professor of counseling as beth said at eastern mennonite here in harrisonburg virginia and I'm so delighted to be with you today to explore together how we as human beings are put together to manage crisis and trauma and how we can foster resilience in such challenging times as these, not only COVID-19, um, but national um, upheaval and a call, clarion call, for uh, equality and equity, such an incredible, uh, incredibly important moment for us. And uh, with COVID-19 uh, as a species, really, this being a species defining moment for us, it's my hope to support you in an understanding of how you might continue to respond in your work and in your life during this time of national and global crisis uh, as we learn to live uh, with calls for and learn to practice justice and learn to live with a virus uh, and its impacts. So I've organized our time today around three main questions that we'll explore in turn. First, as you see, how have our brains and nervous systems evolved to respond to crisis and trauma? Here, we'll look specifically at the neurobiology of the human stress response and describe how our development as human beings unfolds so wisely so wisely to ensure our protection, even if it later comes back to bite us, so to speak, which we'll also discuss. 
Next, we'll touch on the question, what supports and enhances our capacity for resilience? With a description of the kinds of conditions that foster well-being. And finally, we'll wrap up with a hint of interpersonal neurobiology as we look at the question, how can the tiny ripples of attachment security in our daily lives influence these massive forces moving in our country and across the globe? And as Guy said, there'll be a, a brief time at the end for questions and comments. So let's begin with a few core concepts for our time together. Um, first, when I speak of neurobiology, uh, I'm referring to what I call the embodied brain. So I'm including in this concept the brain and all aspects of the nervous system, central and peripheral. As we'll see, understanding and coming home to the experience of our bodies is exceedingly important for developing a clear picture of how crisis, trauma, and resilience affect our self-experience overall. With regard to differentiating crisis and trauma, crisis can be defined as any time-limited, intensely distressing situation or event that overwhelms one's usual problem-solving and decision-making capabilities. Surely the stakes are high in crisis and all of us are familiar with the dangers of crisis situation and generally associate crisis with danger, rightly so. However, contemporary scholars have found that crisis presents both danger and a simultaneous potential for growth. It all depends on how we're able to respond and manage crisis situations. That said, crisis is not necessarily traumatic. Trauma, which is likely precipitated and experienced first as the danger of a crisis, is defined as any experience that threatens or is perceived to threaten one's life or one's bodily integrity in some manner. Trauma causes psychological harm. Trauma can further be defined as an overwhelming affective or emotional experience in the face of unwilled and unwanted aloneness. A little bit of a different definition of trauma. And that is in part because from an evolutionary standpoint, being alone, just being alone is in and of itself a kind of hardwired fear. In a traumatic experience, such a fear is then compounded by a perception of possible annihilation. So to counter such a possibility, such a terrifying possibility, the human nervous system and slash embodied brain uh, has evolved to ensure our survival. Not only that, it has uh, amazingly evolved to support our ability to procreate and it builds our capacity to nurture our young. And the incredible wisdom here is that it does this through a gradual, cumulative, and iterative process of adaptation to environmental conditions. The most important environmental condition 
is the relational surround in which we are first bathed in the womb and then into which we are born. We continue to soak up and soak in each moment of encounter, each shift in the parental gaze, each and every touch and cuddle as our infant brain continues its adaptation with each of tens of thousands of micro responses acting to maximize the possibility that we are safe, secure, seen, and soothed. These are sometimes called the four S's of a secure attachment, safe, secure, seen, and soothed. This capacity for adaptation is a hallmark of the human nervous system and uh, as such has proven to function quite well, given that we human beings can adapt to the most harsh of conditions, both in the environment itself and in the relational surround. However, this process, this incredibly useful process of adaptation also means that patterned responses that were once necessary to survive one situation may be unhelpful and even harmful in another, a different situation. What's more is that we may be ourselves completely unaware of such patterns of our own stress response system and ascribe these patterned responses to genetics, to personality, or to other factors. Another way to think of how we have evolved is with regard to safety and danger. As human beings were primed to recognize both of these from birth and to respond accordingly, again, to stay safe. The science of attachment demonstrates convincingly that babies adapt their nervous systems to the relational patterns of their caregivers, resulting in identifiable, reliable, and predictable behavioral responses at 12 months of age. Some scholars uh, have even found behavioral correlates to 12-month attachment patterns as early as four months of age. It's an incredible thing. By four months of age, we've had enough repetitions of certain kinds of responsiveness in our relationship that we begin to show patterning. Uh, remarkable. We can think of the variables in the environment of which the parent-child relationship is the most important as providing both protective factors and risk factors. In fact, really human development overall can be conceptualized, uh, thought of as a balance between protection and risk, between assets and vulnerabilities. And some might say, well, but what about genetics? Well, of course, of course, genes are critically important as a starting point. Genetics set the stage. It is experience, however, that writes the play. Moving back to our embodied brain in particular, we are wired uh, to move towards safety and to move away from danger. It's just what we do as human beings. In typical development, we move toward our attachment figure for safety and security. We get proximity to our attachment figure. And as we do, our felt sense of security increases and our felt experience of threat decreases. We become soothed and what we call down-regulated 
in the presence of a warm, nurturing other, our stress response system has really done its job by bringing us in close proximity to someone bigger, stronger, wiser, and kind, very important, who protects us, sees us, and calms us. And it's in this way that resilience is really built, is really uh, structured. So there is a nice example in uh, the film that is called Frequency, if you ever get a chance to see it, um, of a little bit of what this looks like as humans uh, kind of have had many repetitions as infants. And then as we grow, as we get a little bit older with that, uh, what this pattern of security really looks like for us. And it can look a little bit different in older uh, children. Older children uh, still have um, the capacity, of course, to get close physically, but what we see often is that closeness becomes more mediated by language, by verbal and nonverbal uh, kinds of uh, messages, uh, certainly as well as touch, an arm around the shoulder, a touch of the hand. Um, uh, we won't be able to actually see, unfortunately, this uh, video here, um, but in this very brief clip, um, what you will notice is uh, each person, there's a rhythm, reciprocity, a mutuality in the movement here of um, the child bringing a sense of what is difficult and the dad, here we are coming to Father's Day this weekend, um, the dad attuning to the child's feeling state and responding in a way that says, I see you, I have you, I know how you feel, and I'm right here with you um, to help you soothe and downregulate. And uh, we, in using uh, this clip for some of the work that we do, we used to joke that whoever wrote this particular script had a profound sense of what secure attachment looks like in practice. Um, so again, this is from the movie Frequency, and unfortunately some technical glitches are gonna um, not allow us to see this particular clip, but um, I would encourage you uh, to take a look at that if you have a chance uh, here. Um, and in fact, in this film, there are two versions of this experience uh, here. In uh, this is, I think, the second version of it is the secure one. So, um, another way for us to uh, look at this is really seeing the adult in any given scenario as a secure, what we might call true other, uh, someone who is down-regulated and calm as the adult meets a child's anxiety and fear with kindness, with curiosity, and with possibility. Uh, what you're seeing here is an example that it describes a, a teacher, potentially, and a quite dysregulated child, a child who is having a lot of difficulty. And in particular, you will notice the word co-regulation. And this is a critical concept uh, to which I'll return a little later. And what you'll notice here uh, is the down-regulated state of the teacher allows the teacher to notice, again, the child's state of reactivity, the child going from a state, and we'll say more about this later as well, of alarm up into fear, and the teacher doesn't follow the child there, uh, but instead attunes to the child just enough so that this uh, persistent, patient, present, parallel kind of responsiveness really facilitates the capacity of the child to take in 
in this case, the teacher's down-regulated state of mind. So I'll say that again, that it facilitates the capacity for the child to take in the teachers or the parents or whoever is the adult down-regulated state of mind. And this is a really important element here of we're not just teaching a skill. We're showing up in a way that provides an opportunity for our kids to take us in, to take this down regulation, this calm, the sense that I've got you. Our state of mind is what they're taking in and internalizing. I, I am jumping ahead a little bit here in terms of state of mind, uh, as that's really the domain of interpersonal neurobiology, um, a field of study that names the ways in which human relationship creates and shapes the brain through experiences of mind. Pretty remarkable. Human relationship creates and shapes the brain through experiences of mind. We can imagine in any, any scenario like this where, again, there's a, a, a child having a very difficult time and a parent, a teacher, a, a wise, kind other uh, who gets to soak up and soak in uh, the, the caregivers, the teachers, the parents calm and down-regulated state of mind that currently in a, in a current situation of difficulty, of crisis, um, will, will uh, aid the child in down-regulating and builds capacity, inner capacity, such that later in this child's life, this hypothetical child here, uh, the rhythm and relationship of co-regulation then provides this child something to access on his own in a variety of relationships and circumstances, not the least of which will be with the child's own children. So this is how attachment patterns, in this case, we're talking about a secure pattern uh, in theory, move from generation to generation here. Um, our children soaking us up and soaking us in as we co-regulate their emotional experience. Um, one thing that I, I say uh, so often is that co-regulation leads to self-regulation. And we'll see more about this here in a moment. Interestingly, um, in the rest of our uh, uh, mammal <laughs> kinds of, um, um, all the other animals on earth, mammals in particular, um, interestingly enough, research demonstrates that the overall health and life course of us, we humans, and our mammal friends are powerfully influenced by what are sometimes called the social determinants of health. And of course, as many of you probably know, uh, in humans, some of the most powerful convincing evidence for this claim is found in the Anda and Felitti study of the impact of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs across the lifespan. More and more, science is telling us that our embodied brain is actually uh, a social organ, really giving support to the concept of the social brain. And again, as we think about interpersonal neurobiology, uh, we'll touch on this a little bit later. Indeed, uh, our animal friends, while not able, as far as we know, um, to think about risk and protective factors and plan societies around, we hope, mitigating risk and increasing protection, nonetheless are impacted similarly by social adversity. To quote a different study, and this is, quote, social adversity is closely linked to health and mortality outcomes in humans across the life course 
these observations as re have recently been extended to other social mammals in which social integration, social status, and early life adversity have been shown to predict natural lifespans in wild populations and molecular, physiological, and disease outcomes and in experimental animal models, unquote. And so, again, we're seeing the same kinds of um, uh, realities across species with regard to the stress response, the notion of a social brain um, that registers how we uh, are, who we are to one another and with one another in the world. And Guy, if you could um, go ahead and pull up the video, we'll now see another example of the embodied brain in action in this brief video with commentary by the eminent psychologist Ed Tronic. Okay, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and get this started. Yeah, thanks. All right, bear with me here. And babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying 34 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I mean, like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, what a good girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Thank you, Guy, for that. Um, I love that video for so many reasons. And uh, one of them is we saw the embodied brain doing what it evolved to do. Uh, there's distress. I'm, I'm disconnected and I want to move towards safety. I want to reconnect. The baby here was cueing for connection by crying, um, saying, I need you, mom. There was a brief experimentally induced rupture in the parent-child relationship, followed closely by an effective and meaningful repair that provided the relational guidance for the child's nervous system to return to a baseline state. In this case, a state of delightful and engaging play. 
Really important to note that the building blocks of resilience are first laid here. The bricks and mortar found in the often subtle but essential process of attunement, rupture, repair, and reattunement in tens of thousands of micro interactions between parent and child. The parent child relationship is the most powerful influence on how a child's stress response system is organized. How do these processes work in the embodied brain? And what happens when they don't work so well? What happens when there is too much risk and not enough asset? What happens when the stress is too big? When, as I sometimes say to my child patients, uh, our feelings are so big that they leak out of our bodies. It's complicated <laughs> and uh, we have time, of course, only to scratch the surface, but um, here are some parts of the embodied brain and related concepts that are implicated in some of the answers to those questions. Let's take a look at the brain itself and something called the HPA axis for more of an explanation. Um, you'll note here the amygdala, um, part of the brain's early warning system that is involved in the neuroception of threat and involved in overall emotional experience. Indeed, our brains, our embodied brains, have evolved to respond to threat viscerally and automatically long before the cortical or thinking part of our brain is able to. Such an adaptation can be incredibly useful when we perceive a threat. Another way to look at the brain is through the use of a simplified heuristic. Um, this is one created and used widely by Dr. Bruce Perry and the uh, neurosequential network um, with whom I've really had the deep pleasure of learning and training for the last several years. Um, and in this model, uh, which again is uh, Perry's work, you'll notice several elements. First, um, this is really a model of the brain itself. The embodied brain, as I'm talking about, is represented by the lines here uh, at the bottom in the red part, uh, showing connection to the rest of the central nervous system, as well as connection to the peripheral nervous system, which includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. Now, don't worry, there won't be a test. Um, uh, I will say a little bit more about those in a bit. What you'll also notice is that in this model of the brain, uh, the emphasis is on the manner in which the brain develops sequentially, hence the neurosequential model. In other words, the neural networks that comprise the brain stem there in the red are first to develop in utero, and then the brain continues to organize and develop in a sequential matter, uh, manner throughout early childhood, uh, childhood, and so on. The earliest parts of our brain to develop are those that, as you might imagine, regulate our most basic metabolic processes as seen there on the right. And also on the right, as we kind of move up the brain, we notice changes in the functionality of various subsystems of neural networks that culminate in the cortex. And of course, the cortex, the part of the brain that gives us the capacity to think rationally, to think abstractly, to problem solve, to organize ourselves into societies, even contemplate our own death. However, our brain is very, very good at keeping us alive. So much so that it adapts, as we've said, to the relational surround. We'll return to these uh, additional implications of these adaptive capacities here in just a moment. 
for the purposes of understanding crisis and trauma, um, and remember this adaptation process, we can say that all adaptation both produces and is produced by patterns of activation in the embodied brain. Remember, this is an iterative process. So it both produces and is produced by patterns of activation in the embodied brain. So the more a person experiences stress activation that is predictable, moderate, and controlled, the more one's nervous system becomes resilient. However, the more a person experiences stress activation that is unpredictable, intense, prolonged, particularly without a relational buffer, the more a person's nervous system becomes vulnerable. Here on the left, we call this a sensitized stress response. Developmentally, most people are somewhere in the middle, middle or neurotypical, wherein a moderate and predictable degree of stress leads to engagement with the world in useful and productive ways. Um, some of you may be familiar with the old concept of the yerkes dodson curve um, that demonstrates too little stress is really not useful for human beings, nor is too much. We kind of need that Goldilocks optimal level of stress in order to meet the demands of everyday life. As we saw in uh, the Tronic video, under conditions of average stress, we develop neurotypically. Um, there are some um, um, qualifiers to that, but for, for the most part, we'll, we'll say that for now. Um, here, what we see is the functionality of what is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis, which uh, really is a dynamic interplay between the brain, nervous system, and endocrine system. So if you look at this image all the way to the left, you see in the green an HPA axis working well. Um, and this is a, a quote here that I uh, found on a wonderful website called the Integrative um, physician, I'll tell you in just a moment, but uh, essentially this system works fairly straightforward. Um, uh, the HPA axis is uh, responsible for the neuroendocrine adaptation component of the stress response. The stress response is characterized by the hypothalamic release of corticotropin releasing factor or CRF. Sometimes it's called CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone. When CRF binds to CRF receptors on the anterior pituitary, adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH is released. That ACTH binds to receptors on the adrenal cortex and stimulates adrenal release of cortisol. In response to stressors, cortisol will be released for several hours after encountering the stressor. At a certain blood concentration of cortisol, this protection um, from the stressor is in theory achieved and the cortisol exerts a negative feedback on the hypothalamic release of CRF and the pituitary release of ACTH, at this point, homeostasis returns. And as I mentioned, this information is from a wonderful website and blog called the integrativepro.com. Um, you'll notice also the immune cells there on the image. Um, again, with short bursts of predictable stress, cortisol blocks activation of inflammatory immune cells. But with chronic stress, the entire system begins to change. Over time, with the continuous activation of cortisol, inflammatory immune cells adapt by downregulating their receptors. 
and sending inflammatory cytokines to the brain. Inflammatory cells also affect amylase in saliva. So sometimes people will actually use saliva samples to measure stress response. Um, the yellow image here in the middle demonstrates uh, a condition called cortisol resistance, where cortisol is no longer able to downregulate inflammatory cells, and so more information, uh, excuse me, inf inflammation uh, occurs. All the way to the right, continued stress produces a state known as adrenal fatigue when the adrenal glands attempting to produce more and more cortisol to deal with stress become exhausted. And uh, um, the capacity to produce even normal amounts of cortisol is lost. And often people in this state of um, exhaustion, cortisol exhaustion, uh, experience deep clinical depression. So the regulatory balance between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system is also compromised, possibly further uh, contributing to immune dysfunction. Another way to illustrate the biology is to think in terms of the pattern. You know, we talked earlier about patterns in terms of attachment. Here, uh, we're talking about pattern of stress activation as represented by the red lines. And again, this work from uh, the Child Trauma Academy and Dr. Perry. Uh, you'll notice here the embodied brain when exposed to prolonged, unpredictable, and sometimes intense stress becomes sensitized. The nervous system continuing in a state of vigilance. Remember also that the more a neural network is activated, the more that that network changes as a reflection of the pattern of stimulation. Another illustration is found here in this uh, chart. And again, you'll note the adaptive response that is indicated. Um, one's adaptive responding as an individual depends on many variables not the least of which is the capacity to access inner cognitive and affective resources that have been built. Remember our example from before, soaked up and soaked in. Resources that have been built from the experience of being safe, secure, seen, and soothed. So what sometimes people call coping is actually a property of self-regulation. Again, a capacity that emerges from thousands, tens of thousands of micro experiences of co-regulation. I wanna say that again to emphasize, co-regulation begets self-regulation. And as I've alluded to these days, we often hear the language of self-regulation as though it's a narrow skill that can be taught or expected, particularly in school settings. Um, grit is another manifestation of this broader concept. Again, something uh, that is a skill that can be developed. Um, the story somewhat goes that we only need to provide better skill development in order to address the difficulties inherent to teaching and learning and in all manner of working with others whose behavior we find difficult or confusing or both. Um, my sense is we really need to reconceptualize of self-regulation as a relational capacity that arises out of and from our experience of others. In particular, it arises within our nervous systems as a relationship to self that provides an inner felt sense of being able to feel and deal with our emotional self-experience. In other words, our social brains have evolved to know how to deal with stress effectively only in relationship with others. Once we've had enough repetitions 
with others, particularly a bigger, stronger, wiser, kinder other, then, and only then, can we do it on our own. Our developing nervous systems mirror those of our caregivers in the patterns and rhythms of soothing and care, or the lack thereof. When we haven't maybe had enough repetitions of secure moments in our caregiving and or we've experienced deep threat to our sense of survival without a buffering relationship to help, our embodied brain helps us to survive by changing our nervous system's response to a perceived stressor. We may become able to feel but not deal with emotional overwhelm or deal but not feel. Our responses are dependent on the state of our nervous system, our embodied brain, something that uh, Bruce Perry calls state dependent functioning. And here, what you'll notice in this chart is that the capacity, the ability to access certain functions of our embodied brain is dependent on the state of our nervous system, of our uh, entire sense of um, calm versus fear versus terror. Uh, for example, as you'll see, when we are calm and down-regulated, we can access all aspects of our functioning. This is really the state, um, call it a state of mind, a state of um, being in which abstract thinking uh, really is paramount. Um, rationality there, the capacity, as you see, to reflect. However, as stress increases, our ability to access decision-making and problem-solving strategies decreases. Indeed, when we are in a place of fear or terror, we are literally not capable of rational decision-making. Our neocortex, our cognitive capacities go offline <laughs> and our embodied brain creates physiological conditions along, as we've said, the HPA axis that enable our survival. You've heard of fight and flight, and we are so-called in our brain stem. So our, our actions are dependent upon the state of emotional arousal that we're experiencing. As you look at this question, uh, by now you may be able to intuit a response, what supports and enhances our capacity for resilience, uh, what kinds of experiences help create a healthy embodied brain that can thrive even amidst later stressors. And as we've seen, simply put, um, in an ideal world, right? Predictable, moderate, controlled experiences of stress create patterns of activation that foster resilient nervous systems. These keep us in our affective, uh, what's called window of tolerance, a concept that describes kind of our capacity to feel and deal with a given stressor. Unpredictable, intense, chaotic experiences of stress create patterns of activation that foster vulnerable nervous systems. As a counterpoint to the earlier graph uh, that showed the development of a sensitized stress response, uh, this graph here demonstrates the opposite a pattern of stress activation that builds resilience. And again, you'll notice the red lines as uh, representative of presentations of stress, and this time moderate, predictable, controlled, uh, that the embodied brain takes in. Um, 
And here you're seeing that even a sensitized stress response system can heal when provided the right kinds of conditions. Given the uncertainty of the time in which we live and the presence of um, COVID-19, um, the presence of um, uh, upheaval in our social world, uh, what are some specific actions we can take to attempt to manage unpredictability of all that is happening? And here you'll note some outer conditions of our lives, some of which some of us can influence easily and readily. Uh, some of these, of course, take greater intentionality to shift uh, if we're able to. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. This, of course, from the late Robert F. Kennedy, whose generation faced the ravages of World War II, the Vietnam War, and the deep divisions caused by racism that we still, sadly, have yet to resolve in our day. Tiny ripples are those small moments, some of which you saw in the video there, that make an enormous difference in human relating. Uh, indeed, a great soul, Mother Teresa, said, we cannot do great things, only small things with great love. And as I reflect on the purpose of the Alliance um, Against Seclusion and Restraint, I am so moved by the commitment not only to advocacy, but also to the commitment to embracing the wisdom of an ethic of kindness, of generosity, and of restorative means of being with those whose behavior is perceived to be difficult or confusing. Those conditions that are most likely to be helpful in this time of national and global crisis are all paradoxically relational. Uh, remember that our embodied brains have evolved as social organs. We still need one another. We deeply need human contact human touch. We need to feel the rhythms of co-regulation. How do we do that when the very idea of coming into contact with another may be dangerous? It presents an impossible dilemma where what we most need uh, is dangerous. Incidentally, such a dilemma characterizes what we call disorganized attachment. Uh, we may feel ourselves disorganized and disoriented during such a time of crisis and uncertainty. In the US, we see the injustice of racism manifesting as crisis, which surely it is every moment of every day for those whose skin tone is not white. The historical trauma of 400 years of oppression has had and continues to have deep and severe life or death consequences for people of color in the US. With regard to race, the threads of connection are tattered, torn, and ruptured. And what we know from the literature of attachment is that conscious, intentional, authentic healing and repair is necessary. Like any attempt at change, however, we first must acknowledge that there as a, is a problem. And um, Beth and others at the Alliance continue to be so courageous at naming problems, most recently advocating with the friends and relatives of Matthew Russian, a black autistic man whose wrongful imprisonment demonstrates not only the ignorance of the criminal justice system to matters of state dependent functioning, but also the radical importance of every single individual conf confronting their own implicit assumptions about race. 
there is so much work to be done. And there is no easy answer. And yet, perhaps our individual voices, amplified as they are by organizations such as this, uh, can be ripples of hope that raised together combine to be a current of systemic and lasting change, providing more and more opportunities for relationships grounded in trust, authenticity, and mutuality to emerge, offering balms of healing to our fractured world. With regard specifically to COVID, um, there is no easy answer here either regarding the wider social consequences of the virus. Uh, perhaps the best answer is to take all reasonable precautions in order to decrease the risk to a level that's acceptable to you. And of course, that threshold will vary according to a number of factors. Um, and in many ways, it's a similar kind of action that we've uh, always undertaken as human beings, um, even getting in a car, even though many of us take that for granted, is uh, implicitly acknowledging a level of risk that one deems acceptable. Um, COVID-19 really invites each of us to attend more mindfully, not only to our own daily habits and practices, but also to the manner in which our actions our small ripples affect others. In terms of the definition of crisis as danger and opportunity, maybe we can take this as an opportunity to learn to pay attention in a new way to others, to the movements of one's own inner world, to the movements of one's embodied response to the circumstances in the outer world, while also paying high quality attention to our daily habits, to our movements, slowing down. This notion of interpersonal neurobiology holds that we cultivate the mind in part through mindfulness. And here you'll see what uh, Dr. Dan Siegel calls the triangle of experience. And I mentioned a little bit earlier about notions of mind, but um, Siegel defines the mind as an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information within and between brains. And what Siegel proposes is that we can, with intentional practice, um, bring a kind of attention to how the mind emerges in our self-experience. Having a sense and intellectual um, knowledge of the neurobiology of the stress response, such as we've looked at today, um, can really provide a window into another way of knowing on a more visceral and felt level. Tuning in to what is happening at any given moment in our nervous systems, in our embodied brain, and what information is there is a profound way to challenge and mitigate the disorganizing tendencies of crisis. And it will help us in meeting our own needs as well as the needs of those around us for safety. As we've seen earlier, predictable, controlled, and moderate doses of stress in the context of a bigger, stronger, kinder, and wiser relationship are the building blocks of resilience. What can we do when the degree of stress that we experience, however, um, has elements of unpredictability, a lack of moderation, and perhaps a sense that only the crisis itself is in charge in any way. Again, connecting in relationship with important others is the most critical, whether with family members in your home, with people through the internet, 
feeling what you feel. Breathing deeply into your belly several times a day or several times an hour. Mindfully moving your body both in gross motor and fine motor ways. If you find yourself experiencing re-traumatization, um, some powerful emotion that feels too big for you on your own, that's okay. Connect with a therapist or your own if you already have one. Uh, I say, of course, as a therapist, um, and this is a really a critically important aspect here of uh, looking at well-being in the context of, again, attachment security, neurobiology, and cultivating wellness. Um, so with that, uh, I share with you uh, references here and sources um, that I'm happy to share. You can see my email there at the bottom of the page. Um, and we do have some time, I believe, for any questions or comments that may have arisen or that folks have for me. I'd be happy to speak to Excellent. them. Hey, hey, Greg, thank you so much. This has been so, uh, so, so enlightening. I, I, I love uh, having the opportunity to do these sessions um, because it's such a great opportunity to to learn so much. You know, I feel like I took a couple steps towards that baby doctorate degree just just uh, listening to <laughs> listening to everything here. I mean, it, it's really fascinating, and I think really um, so much of it. I, I'm going to pull your presentation off the screen here. If people need uh, information, uh, don't hesitate to ask. But I want to bring us all three up here on the screen again. Um, you know, I mean, it really, I think, resonates probably with so many of us that have had uh, children that have had difficulty in school. You know, of course, we have a lot of concern at the Alliance with things like restraint and seclusion. Mm -hmm. And so much of this is is relevant to that. I mean, you know, I think about, um, you know, the, the importance of, you know, um, I have my own three R's that I think are important for school and it's relationship, mm -hmm. relationship, relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, so much of this goes to that, uh, that importance of, of relationship, that importance of uh, safety. Um, you know, I was taking a lot of notes here and I'm sure we'll have some questions, but this, this is really, yeah, really, really fantastic. Um, you know, one of the things that you said early on that, that resonated with me um, was you were talking about how we're we're being alone, we're hardwired for fear, and I mm. I think about you know uh, tactics that we use in school like seclusion, yeah, yeah. and you know it, it's just uh, you know we're, we're doing the opposite of really what we need to be doing, and yes, you know one of the things that we sometimes see and and have heard experiences from others with is that you know I think back to that graphic you had showing kind of the the co-regulation as the, the teacher began to kind of help the student re-regulate. And unfortunately, sometimes what happens is a student escalates. So does the yes. uh, the teacher, the educator, That's and right. and in fact, they begin to put more demands on the child and and want compliance. And right. as you mentioned, at that point, the child they're not accessing their frontal cortex. They're not yep. making rational decisions. So the the impact the impact of this is so critical. And I definitely want to encourage our, our viewers that are out there. Uh, you know, if you are a um, if you're a parent share this with your teachers and with your your schools. You know, if you're a teacher, share this with your parents. Uh, you know, I think this information is so critical in, in working with kids. And, and I just really appreciate you coming here and sharing your expertise. So I know we're gonna have some questions, um, but I just wanna again, thank you for taking the time to share this with us. Absolutely, and I so appreciate being able to do it. Yes. So uh, Beth, I, uh, let me, hand it over to you for a second. I've got a question I'm going to queue up, but in the meantime. Okay. I'm going to make, I had several observations. <clears throat> One of them was that the the model, the ideal for a long time was independence, self-independence. Mm -hmm. It's the self-made man. Mm -hmm. Science is saying, no, that's not the way it works. And I think that's a really important thing because I also, th I think that gives advice and direction to schools about how you want to have partners to learn. You mm -hmm. want to be um, working together. You want to have this ability to connect with a teacher, a social worker, uh, uh, the janitor, whoever that you feel safe with in order to uh, get to that, that sense of safety. I think yeah. that's powerful information. So it's not some weak person 
yeah. who needs to go talk to their um, whoever powerful person. It is actually biologically yeah. necessary. And can I comment on that? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, so for those interested in, in uh, more support for what you're saying, there's a wonderful researcher just over the hill from me uh, at the University of Virginia by the name of Jim Cohen, C-O-A-N. And um, uh, he's done work in the MRI scanner and something mm -hmm. he calls the hand-holding ex uh, experiment. And, mm -hmm. you know, can, can demonstrate experimentally um, that our stress levels uh, in terms of perceived threat, uh, decrease when someone is there, even if it's a stranger, uh, holding our hand, another human being, that that is down-regulating. It's particularly down-regulating if that human being happens to be a spouse or partner, or what have you, but it's uh, led him to develop what he calls a social baseline theory. In other words, that the fundamental unit of the human being is not one, but two, <laughs> that fun, again, fundamentally, we are um, we are to be together socially. So again, the social brain kind of uh, fits in there. But I would ma I mention him only because again, more support there for what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It sounds sounds like a potential uh, future guest. Maybe we can. Uh... Uh, he, he would be dynamite. He okay, that's be great. Dynamite. That's yeah. great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing, and then I'll let things. Uh, uh, questions come up. I was struck by a couple things you said that made me think about family members, uh, specifically my husband and my son. Um, you talked about dealing but not feeling and feeling and not dealing. I live with somebody and I raise somebody who are opposite of me. I feel and not deal so well. <laughs> mm. They deal and don't feel. Uh, and, and, you know, I keep saying your solution is to feel. And you know, I, I, that was really insightful to me. And, and the other thing that, that that blocks where you had the blue chart and you came down to where the um, inflammation and then it's either yes. pain or depression. Uh -huh. I don't know whether it's either or, but in my family, my husband and I having gone through years and years and years of trauma uh, where our boys were having trouble, he developed incredible, he has such pain every single day. I mean, he was having pain when I was 100 pounds overweight. I did not have pain in my joints. He, perfectly the weight, you know, right, hurts all the time. Mm -hmm. I had depression. Mm -hmm. uh, it just struck me that it was yeah. interesting how, uh, and then you don't, it's hard, if you don't understand the science, you don't understand yeah. the other person, why it's different. Or yeah. You don't well, consider it. And for a deeper dive into that, um, a wonderful book that I think was on the New York Times bestseller, I think number one for some time, but uh, Bessel van der Kolk uh, oh, called Body, the Body, Keeps the Body, Keeps the Body Keeps the Score. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. you know, it's again, this kind of consilience of uh, many different fields uh, scientifically saying um, very similar kinds of, of things uh, here. You know, I shared a slide about uh, studies of mammals, you know, and so we just have some of these um, findings that um, really do challenge. And Beth, as you said, that kind of individualistic notion that I think so often um, is guiding some of, you know, decision-making processes and the way that particularly educational systems are yeah. designed and, and so on and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so, so I want to shift into some questions and, and also just on the, uh, to piggyback on that, I, you know, I love the, uh, I'm trying to get the words right here. Um, when you talk about bigger, stronger, and kinder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly uh, really brings a key light on how important uh, parents, caregivers, educators are yeah. to helping with that. So I want to bring up something, and this I think came from when you were talking about uh, uh, cortisol in the brain and Dea Cheney-Webb, who is actually a member of our team, and I'll mention runs our amazing uh, new <laughs> LinkedIn page as well. Uh, um, but she asked the question about cortisol increase in individuals with autism. Uh, can that also contribute to seizure activity? Ooh. Yeah. And I'm going to say a wonderful question that... Um, uh, I frankly would need to do some research on to find out about. I do not know specifically, um, yeah, how that how that interacts. But um, yeah, so I will <laughs> I will say let me get back to you on that. Um, but that's a great question. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do not have an answer. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring up a comment here as well. And this is from, from Amy Welch. Uh, and this was a comment that I've made a lot of teachers angry uh, with me for speaking up in the classroom that a student who is in a heightened state cannot and, or, and will not learn and needs to take a break. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, you know, as we talked about, and I'm so uh, fond of Beth's fondness for state dependent functioning. And yeah. so, you know, again, when the nervous system is in a state of fear, uh, and that neurobiologically shuts down and for good reason, you know, for survival reasons, uh, but it shuts down. Um, what schools so typically are valuing in terms of, again, cognitive, yeah. Uh, abstract uh, learning processes. So, um, yeah, it, that is very much uh, this information and, and particularly state dependent functioning uh, can be very impactful and important for schools mm -hmm. to understand. And so, perhaps some language around that and, you know. With uh, the neurosequential network, um, uh, Dr. Perry has office hours and has a number of different YouTube videos available that really go into um, greater depth around that. Might be a good resource for uh, Amy. I think Amy was the person. Yes, yes Amy. Amy. Um, yeah, it might be a good resource to consult for additional information there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing is when you were talking about the present, patient, persistent, mm -hmm. and parallel. Mm -hmm. That struck me. A question came up today or yesterday. I've lost all track of time um, about if we don't have restraints. It's the same question that, that always comes up. If we don't have restraint, then how do we deal with it? And I started with some of the preventative things you do in my response to that. But I also um, what I have been learning from uh, Bruce Perry is you, you don't. Well, not just from him, from everyone. You don't. You don't engage a child who is at such a high level of stress that they cannot look at you. They don't want to. They don't want to be touched. Yeah. They are at such a level, but you can reach them by being beside them, patient, persistent, parallel, which helps them calm down, helps them regulate, and then when they get regulated, then you can uh, interact. I think they. Call, I think he calls it regulate. Um, Regu regulate, uh, relate. Relate and then reason, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> but to me, that was just such a perfect way. I think about it when I would drive with my kids and they never speak to you, but when you're side by side, not you know, in my face, you can have some really good um, kind of interaction. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in that in that kind of, you know, if we soak up and soak in, then how is it that we ourselves as teachers, as parents and as parents, it can be really, <laughs> really challenging, as we know, um, yeah. as teachers as well, you know, but how do we find ourselves in a state of mind that really can hold not physically right <laughs> emotionally hold the space? for mm -hmm. someone to feel the big feelings that they're that they're dealing with. And so, you know, when we can hold that space, we talk about this a lot in training um, counselors and therapists, how do we hold space for uh, people who are having experiences of big, big feelings? And that's such a critical thing to be able to do, especially with kids. Um, and in, in many cases, you know, kids haven't had unfortunately, a lot of experience of someone being able to hold space for them in that way mm. to say, you can feel what you feel and, and it's okay. And I'm gonna, I'm in it here with you and we'll find a way together, even if neither of us really understand what you're feeling right now. And here I am to help you with it. That, that kind of message for a child to begin to hear that I'm not alone in the big feeling that I have, and I don't have to handle it all by myself, is incredibly powerful. And sometimes that alone can br start to bring down regulation. Um, we as teachers, as parents, as caregivers, just have to be ourselves having that kind of presence that can welcome that 
And that can be really hard when the, you know, child, uh, their behavior is prickly, as we might say, you know. Um, so, uh, so, yes. So let, let me take that one step further. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot at the Alliance, and, and Beth, I know you're, you're a big proponent of this, is, is the importance of getting modern neuroscience into our schools. Uh, yeah. Because there seems to be really kind of a vacuum. A lot of this information, the impacts of trauma, uh, you know, relational safety, a lot of this does not exist in, in, in schools and classrooms across the country. Um, so, so that's really important. But I, I would ask you, kind of building on what you were talking about, you know, if, if there was a take home message you would give to a teacher that is, is commonly working with kids that are going into crisis, um, you know, what would be your starting point for, for any kind of recommendation to them to get them moving on a pathway to, to help them? Yeah, that's a, um, well, I think probably the first, the, the first, and this may sound pithy, but I would kind of want to say, let's start with where you are. <laughs> Um, a lot of what I do with my students learning to be counselors is, of course, you know, we're asking them, well, what has been your experience of crisis? What has been your experience of, you know, when when you yourself were uh, having a difficult time, either as a child or what have you? And I realize, of course, that training therapists is very different from training teachers. Yes. And um, I think that that part of um, helping teachers to understand some of these pieces, actually uh, some of the things that we do as um, counselor educators, you know, training future therapists would actually be quite useful for teachers in terms of looking within. What's my own relationship here to, again, um, let's say crisis, let's say behavioral difficulty. Um, and then depending upon, you know, where the person was and kind of what they were looking for, um, I definitely would direct them to, you know, the type of thing we did today or um, Bruce Perry's work. Um, if you have a chance and read uh, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really eye-opening account. And I think, you know, those kinds of things have the potential to whet someone's appetite for, mm -hmm. whoa, you mean there's a different, there might be different ways for us to do this? Mm -hmm. um, that's not what they taught me in school, which mm -hmm. I should add is another element of really looking at how teachers are trained. Right. Um, and, you know, we have a long history in Virginia of this, SOL, we've got to go in there and do this, you know, hardcore academic whatever stuff with preschoolers. <laughs> you know, they need to know about Rome mm -hmm, um, in mm -hmm. preschool. I mean, I'm being a little facetious, but um, uh, um, I think you're right. You know, it, it's really got to get into teacher education um, and, and how the Department of Education is conceptualizing of what does it mean to be an effective teacher? What mm -hmm. is the, where is modern neuroscience? What does it have to tell us? And I think all of that is, uh, has yet to happen at least here in Virginia. Um, but we've got Beth advocating, so no, I'm anything's let's, possible. Let's, let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, we welcome you to, uh, We'd welcome you to join us for a visit to the Department of Ed as well. You know, oh, yeah. we, we've been there before and uh, would be happy to go back with some some uh, recommendations because we, we really do. And a Amy brought this up in her comment as well, as well about training, uh, but we really do need to get the right kind of training into the classroom. Uh, you know, a lot of our, our training is is kind of carrot and stick based on reward yeah. and consequence, right. you know, which is a model that, that you know, doesn't work for, for many children that uh, they're, they're trying to, to work with. Um, so we absolutely need to make some changes in that area. That's... So I'm just going to make a, a comment about, I, I'm trying to create this, conceptualize. We know what we don't like, but what is it we want? And yeah. so I, I have this vision that this, uh, all of this information that you're sharing will be stuff that everybody learns, mm -hmm. not just the counselors, not just the whoever, but it becomes, and uh, Lori is doing a little bit of that, with teaching kids about their brain and all that. But but I see, I have this vision of starting with have teacher training, you know, so that they can they can teach the others, but that it becomes the norm. I mean, how did consequences and rewards become the norm? I don't know, but we're having a hard time 
getting rid of it. Let's put this instead yeah. as something that we don't have to call. We we need people like you in situations that are difficult. But on a regular everyday basis, all of us should know how to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, that's my vision. <laughs> Well, and I'll say that, and and uh, as you mentioned, the EDS program that we're starting up in school counseling. Um, so the notion there is uh, it's called integrated because it's integrated with our education department, our graduate education school. Right. So that the idea here is that, you know, you're really um, training folks who come out with this with this very idea. So I'm designing a class called the neurobiology of trauma, which actually will cut across. We're not quite exactly sure yet, but um, we're working on it, but it may cut across clinical mental health counseling, uh, school counseling. And then there's a new program called trauma and resilience in healthcare settings. Oh, so perfect. that what will happen potentially is that here's this common body of knowledge that you know, people interprofessionally now are exposed to and know and begin to understand in terms of, again, the human stress response. Well, what do we know about that? What do we know is helpful? We've got really good scientific information around that. Let's get it out to the folks that are going into the field in these areas as teachers, as counselors, as school counselors, as uh, nurses and other healthcare professionals. So as parents. Well, as parents. Add, add, add yeah. parents to that paradigm. Yeah. Because yeah. We, we have the peer recovery specialists, the family support partners. That should be a part of every parent support partner's bank of knowledge. And how enriching to have parents involved with those group yes. of people. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot of comments coming. Uh, you know, here's one from Michelle about the neurobiology of trauma. Yes, uh, you know, uh, obviously that resonating with her. Uh, Sarah talks about, you know, carrots versus sticks don't work. Uh, you know, it's a golden rule. Also mentions kind of a growth mindset framework. Um, so a, a lot of a lot of people are, uh, you know, um, I think this is re resonating with a lot of people out there. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And uh, if anyone has one, and, and Beth, I always... Uh, like to save a last question for you because I know that you always have one. So I'm going to just <laughs> check here and see if we have any more questions in the chat. Uh, and if not, you can uh, queue up your your question here. Um, looks like we got a lot of comments here, um, but this has really, really been fantastic. Uh, you know, I think the importance of of you know getting this uh, you know into into classrooms, um, you know, getting this information. Um, because there's so much unnecessary trauma that kids are mm -hmm. going through in school, yeah, um, and, and 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 elsewhere, but but not being, um, you know, n not having safety, not having regul, you know, co-regulation. Um, I've got one last. Let me look yeah. at this here. That um, last one is really important. Yeah, let's bring this up. Uh, Gail, uh, Gail, I think is our friend from Australia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she said hello a few minutes ago. Uh, teachers need to understand the stress response so that they can understand and manage their own responses in stressful situations. Yep. So needed. Gail might be your sister, Beth. I mean, you know, th this sounds like something I've heard you say <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, this is absolutely Gail. Something that that you know we believe be very sisters. strongly here. That's right. That's right. Um, all right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I would exactly and that's that's so it's not only about what's happening with students it's also about and again when we do work i work for a organization called secure child out of charlottesville we do attachment-based work and um we uh work with the parents because they're the ones that are going to be able, we help the parents to help their kids so that they understand their own sort of inner worlds better and understand their own responses and are, are then able to respond differently and more uh, bigger, and you know, again, bigger, stronger, wiser, and kinder mm -hmm. with their kids. Um, so it is critical that teachers really understand their own patterns of activation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's also cr critical that teachers are supported. I think that's one of the very oh, yes. difficult things. Now, Absolutely. Because they're, they're, their class sizes are so big. Absolutely. There's no break. They don't have time to think and reflect and consider. And we need support, just like the unit is too, 
Well, yep. the teachers are out there on their own. They're on their own. That's long right. with these yep. So yep. the structure of school needs to be set up so that teachers have time yep. to support each other, to reflect, right. to breathe, re-regulate. Um, and I think we have to keep that in mind all the time because- Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I couldn't agree more. So, so we had a question from Sarah asking, what do you think about growth, mi uh, about growth mindset as a framework? Uh, and, and she addressed this to you, Beth. So uh, I'll let either of well, you take a crack. I'll tell you, I'll answer that very quickly. My knowledge of growth mindset is that there's not um, a fixed answer or a fixed, um, it, it's like a possibility way of um, the growth mindset is that things are not fixed. You're not working to do this and that, then you've achieved, achieved it, but you're working that in terms of possibilities, which you mentioned at some point in here that I just love. Can't remember it now. I have to look at those, all those notes, but that possibility was one part of what we looked at. So Sarah, I'm not sure that I know enough, uh, I think it was Sarah, to, about how um, growth mindset is defined or you're defining it. But if it's what I think it is, I think it fits in uh, with what we're talking about, that, that it's about possibilities. Is and, that, and what would you say, Greg? Yeah, really quickly, I, I would say, yeah, it's it's wonderful as far as it goes, and it's another kind of cognitive uh, um, tool or or trick, if you will. Uh, I think it doesn't take into account this whole, um, you know, this the state dependent nature of functioning, and so if a child isn't able to access either fixed or growth mindset because their cognitive uh, uh, capacity is offline for the moment, then, you know, we need to, we need to go into the brain and into the other responses there as well. So, mm -hmm. so we are just about at, at time here. Actually, we were a minute over time. Uh, this has been a really, really great session. Um, Beth, I'll give you, give you a chance for one quick last question or comment, and uh, then we'll get wrapped up. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is you're, what you're developing this new program sounds fabulous. And so my question is an ask. Uh, could you keep us all informed if there's any access to online kinds of things? Yeah. Um, I just think it's a very fabulous opportunity and um, I'd love for us all to be a part of it and a part of learning about it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Greg, thank you again so much. This has been absolutely amazing. i um, really glad to, to uh, have had the opportunity to to meet you or, or rather meet you kind of virtually a, a few months back and, and to have you uh, working with with Beth and us here at the Alliance. Uh, it's so great to have so many um, allies out there that are that are trying to accomplish very similar things. And I look forward to the opportunity to work together with you and others. And, Wonderful. you know, we I think we can do better and yeah. uh, we yeah. really need to keep that going. So uh, thank you so much. Um, okay. I have a couple of quick announcements and uh, I'll be sharing with everybody here. And um, let me just give you a quick announcement about what we have coming up. Uh, we're going to be continuing our series um, and uh, our next event will be on Thursday, July 2nd. Uh, we're gonna have Alex, uh, Alex Campbell, who actually is, uh, Alex is 14 years old. He's been advocating to um, uh, essentially uh, shut down seclusion rooms and end restraint across the, the country. Um, he's been doing a lot of work in Virginia. Uh, for about probably five years. Uh, and he, of course, um, is doing this as a self-advocate. Uh, he's an individual with autism and he's an amazing self-advocate. Uh, and he is really doing a lot of amazing work, not only as part of our team, but has been involved in this for, for many years now. So that is what we've got coming up. Uh, I wanna thank everybody again for joining us today. Uh, definitely uh, been a great presentation and I uh, hope you're enjoying the series. I would encourage you, uh, to visit our website, which is nseclusion.org. You can, of course, then go to our YouTube channel or Facebook and find a whole series of these. We've talked to people like Ross Green and Mona Della Hook, uh, some, some really fantastic guests. So again, thank you. We look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks for this. And uh, again, encourage you to follow us on social media and reach out to us. Uh, and uh, you know, we're all in this together and trying to do something better. So thank you. <laughs>